Boldwood presents Like No Other Soldier, written by Rob Lewis and read by Mark Meadows. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Author's Note Like No Other Soldier is a true recollection of my life experiences since leaving the British Army in May 1991. Some names and identifying details have been changed to protect the privacy of individuals. Where real names appear, they are used in cases of historical fact, and their inclusion is supported by independent, publicly available material. Chapter 1 I had filled in my voluntary discharge papers at Army Headquarters in Northern Ireland, Teepfal Barracks, Lisbon. It was time to move on to a new life and career in the civilian security and investigation world. The chief clerk at headquarters had assured me that it would take about two months for the paperwork to be completed. I would have to attend a few interviews before I was fully cleared and debriefed, but I was happy just to have another few months of pay before I left for good. I had already managed to get a year-long extension of the two-year tour I had done with the Force Research Unit. FRU. This was the elite, undercover military intelligence squad that ran agents during the Troubles. I have previously chronicled my career with this controversial outfit in Fishers of Men. Human Resources decided I now had to either return to my regular unit, the Royal Armoured Corps, who were posted in Germany at the time, or transfer to the Intelligence Corps to be posted to a security section in England. I was not entirely enthused by either choice. For the past few years, I'd been working undercover on secret operations, gathering intelligence to fight terrorism, and the prospect of wearing a uniform and having a short back and sides in the world of regular tank park soldiering was something that just did not appeal. Don't get me wrong. I had enjoyed myself in the army and had made some great mates who would be lifelong friends but it was just not for me. I could never quite understand why the military restricted the length of an operational tour with special duties. It took a significant period of time for anyone to work up good intelligence. Special branch officers at the Royal Ulster Constabulary, RUC, took on their job for life. Obviously, that work came with huge personal risks, but it also led to large amounts of quality intelligence, experience, and knowledge. As the old saying goes, knowledge is power, and they had that power. There was nothing for it. I had to accept the standard way of doing things. I carried on with my normal operational tasks, carrying out covert surveillance and targeting, recruiting, and handling informants, while beginning the process of slowly but surely handing over my usual role to a new operator. Informants sometimes become emotionally attached to their handlers. Over time, they come to rely on us for friendship, guidance, and money. On average, I would make a point of meeting the informants I ran at least once a week to maintain a real relationship with them, and now, gradually, I introduced my replacement to give my informants time to adjust to me standing down. Towards the end of that process, I would only show my face at the occasional meeting just to keep the sense of continuity. I was not involved in the debriefing process, which would be down to the new team. I had various chats with my commanding officer about how I might carry on with this kind of work for other agencies, perhaps MI5 or even MI6. The commanding officer was a great bloke. He was a lieutenant colonel in rank and had previously been in the Gordon Highlanders before transferring into the Intelligence Corps. He had family links to the Fermanagh area, and he played rugby for Enniskillen, a team that he was to introduce me into, and I played regularly for them. It obviously opened up a great social life as well. He told me that he would see what he could arrange. I returned to Lisbon headquarters and met with the senior controller for the security service in Northern Ireland, he seemed like quite a nice guy, but was very dismissive about my joining his organisation. The majority of his surveillance operatives were little more than schoolkids, he said, 
and I could find myself in teams led by people who had far less experience and knowledge than I did. It would be quite hard for me to integrate into their structure. I would, more than likely, be London-based, have to make a commitment to weekend working at least three times a month, and would have to live on starter civil service wages. He didn't put me off. I asked about having a role handling sources. There was bound to be an opening there, surely. The answer was that I would need to have been educated to degree level. It seemed to me that either he was being kind and didn't want to bluntly let me know that I was not appropriate for his organisation, or he was being totally honest in suggesting the work wouldn't be a good fit, given my previous experience. I'd like to think it was the latter. The next week we received intelligence from one of our sources that an AR-15 Armalite rifle was to be used to murder a member of the IUC. One of our sources would have control of the weapon and had been told to hold on to it until he was given a location for delivery. The address was to be given to him in person by a senior member of the Fermanagh and Tyrone Irish Republican Army, IRA, and we knew he would not have the time to let us know where he would be going with the rifle. His property was put under surveillance, with a covert van parked up in direct sight, while a motorbike rider and two cars covered the three possible routes he could take when leaving the area. I was parked in a quiet side street about half a mile away, with the potential to cover two of his routes. We stayed in position for two hours, at which point, under normal operational practice, we would have to move on. It tends to get a bit dangerous to stay in one place too long. Passers-by can get very suspicious. Today, because of the need to keep tabs on the weapon, we stretched out a while longer. Everyone on the team was happy to continue as nobody felt that they had been compromised. We also had a gazelle helicopter at our disposal for top cover. The helicopter was fitted with an optical sight operated by one of our team. If need be, he would be able to control the operation from around 2,000 feet without compromising the ground surveillance. Helicopters were a regular daily sight all over the province, and nobody really paid any attention to them. Stand by, stand by. The covert van operative let all call signs know that there was activity at the target address, and everyone also knew not to say anything over the radio, to keep it clear until we heard the next instruction. The operator with eyes on now had control of the task, and we all waited patiently for his next radio transmission. Bravo 1, complete with package at Alpha 1. The AR-15 was about to be delivered. We used the prefixes Alpha, Bravo and Charlie over the radio to indicate address, person and vehicle. Radio transmissions were always in real time. The operator in the van was describing the activity as it happened. Drop-off complete, and that is Bravo 2 in Charlie 1, heading towards Blue 2 Zero. Our informant had possession of the rifle and was driving his own car towards the main road. We used spot codes made up of colours and numbers to indicate locations, as opposed to speaking road and street names. It was more efficient for surveillance operations, keeping transmissions sharp and direct. Our source, who dropped the weapon off, was allowed to leave the area unhindered. It was imperative that his identity was not compromised, and as we knew who he was, and as the drop-off had been filmed, he could always be picked up later. For the time being, we let the rifle travel to its next destination under surveillance. That is a left, left, left at blue two zero, Charlie one now towards blue two one. The van operative let us know that he had driven to the end of his road and had turned left towards one of the main roads out of town. One of the other car surveillance operators had that route covered, and we soon picked up radio transmissions describing the journey, swiftly backed up by the motorcycle operative. I had to cut across a housing estate and then speed up a bit to tag on to the rest of the surveillance team and wait my turn to take over from the operator who had control of the operation. It was quite a skill. I was driving at about 70 miles an hour through the estate in my haste to catch up when I spotted two police officers waving me down. 
One was holding a speed-detecting gun, and the other had an M1 carbine rifle, a standard police-issue weapon. I pulled over, and one of the officers demanded my driving license, asking if I knew what speed I was doing. My license was in a clear wallet, along with my armed forces identity card. I explained that I was a covert operator on a surveillance mission, adding there were various weapons concealed in the vehicle and I was also carrying a personal weapon. He was not concerned. Maybe you are, but you were doing 70 miles an hour, he replied, and started to write up a ticket. I said that we were covering the transportation of a weapon that was going to be used in a murder attempt on one of his colleagues that evening, and if he had any doubts about this, then he should contact the head of special branch for the area, who would verify the operation. The officer looked at me. Then he returned to his pad, repeating that he would finish writing the ticket and let me go on my way. It was really quite unbelievable. A local officer who I knew strolled over. He also told the traffic cop that I was an undercover FRU operator. This helped in no way at all. Aren't you supposed to be over there? responded my tormentor, dismissing the other policeman back to where he had been covering a roadblock. There was going to be no quick way out of this. My ticket was issued, and I had to drive back to base. By this point, the surveillance team had got several miles away, and I knew I was never going to be able to catch up. I radioed the operations centre, and heard that the boss had taken the right decision. They deployed the helicopter, and the weapon was still under our control. I drove into our detachment compound, unloaded my weapons outside the building, and wandered into the operations room. I was absolutely fuming. I discussed the ticket with my boss, whose advice was to let the process play itself out. I could plead guilty without attending court and pay a fine which would be covered by work. I would, however, have to take the license points on the chin. I soon forgot all about the aggravation when he went on to reveal that headquarters had abruptly said I could leave the army right away. I was mystified. I knew I was leaving, but I thought my exit would be another six or seven weeks away. Apparently it was moving forward more quickly. Much more quickly. The Royal Armoured Corps Human Resources Unit, based in Glasgow, had sanctioned my request to leave. I was officially out of the army on Friday, Bloody hell, this was Wednesday. I had just 48 hours in which to hand over all of my covert kit, a variety of weapons in my possession, and my operational car. At the same time, I had to pack up my house and get my last reports in. I also had to drive to headquarters in Lisbon for a commanding officer's exit interview and be back in time for my leaving piss-up at the detachment. The process confirmed that no matter how important my role was, and no matter how much I thought the system owed me a favour, I was still just a number as far as the army was concerned. Some clerk pressed the delete key, and whoosh, I was gone. It was all a bit manic, but I managed to get everything done. We rounded off the week with a pretty good team drinking session. The boss asked me not to return to the office, and to ignore any of the other operators, should I see them locally. They had been briefed to sideswipe me, should they see me. He said a few words about me in the bar, and I had a painting and a bronze statuette presented to me by the detachment. Both featured fly fishermen, as everyone in the detachment knew of my love for the sport. The painting had a brass plate inscribed, To Rob, Pax Vobiscum the Latin phrase for peace be with you. I had spent just less than sixteen years in the army, with less than seven years on active service in Northern Ireland, either patrolling the streets and countryside or as a covert operator. At the end of that last night, the detachment duty driver gave me a lift to town, we shook hands, said our farewells and parted ways. I was going to be staying in the local area for a few more months, sorting out my CV 
and contacting a list of security companies given to me by the resettlement officer at headquarters. At my exit interview, I was given three open return flight tickets by one of the clerks. They were all valid for six months and would come in handy for attending interviews on the mainland. I had also been given my regular army certificate of service, the little red book, as it is known in the army. My commanding officer wrote a letter of recommendation. Sergeant Lewis has had a very good career in the army and is now leaving to pursue a second career. As an NCO, non-commissioned officer, he proved to be adaptable, resourceful and thoroughly reliable. As an SNCO, senior non-commissioned officer, he demonstrated a high standard of management skills. His decision-making was well balanced between common sense, fairness and sound judgment. He is well suited to middle management appointments. He is articulate and very presentable. Sergeant Lewis is a good team member and will be a valuable asset to any future employer. The Army had assessed me as one grade below the top rating of exemplary, as I had been a bit of a rogue and naughty boy when I was based in Germany in my old regiment. I had a number of charges on my conduct sheet that meant very good was really all I could hope for. It wouldn't be a problem. Most of the companies that I would reach out to had an ex-military hierarchy and employed similar servicemen and women. My experiences in special duties would more than compensate for not having an exemplary service record. In any case, I did not know many colleagues who left with the top grade. From time to time I would see some of my old colleagues on the streets. We sometimes had brief conversations unless I saw that they were on an operation when I would avoid them. I had chosen to stay in the province, and I had to deal with the potential risks of life in the area. I still had my army identity card, as the boss had forgotten to get me to hand it in, and I thought it might come in useful in the future. I still have it, to this day. At home, I kept a riot baton by the side of the bed. It was hardly the same as having a Browning 9mm pistol and a Heckler & Koch machine gun, but it was still something for a worst-case scenario. I had also kept back a flashbang, a grenade that contained several smaller explosive devices that acted like mini firecrackers, also discharging CS gas. This could be used to clear a room in close-quarter battle situations, disorientating anyone in the vicinity. You might remember how effective they were when they were used by the SAS during the Iranian embassy siege of 1980 at Prince's Gate in London. A flashbang wasn't exactly what I would have liked to protect myself, but if I had to use it, it would give me valuable seconds. Living and working in Northern Ireland was dangerous at the best of times, even when I'd had the full range of weaponry and communications at my disposal. I was now totally out on a limb with none of those safety measures. I had to live on my wits and take great care not to compromise myself. The consequences could be deadly. There were a number of people who knew me who had links to terrorists. My skills at anti-surveillance techniques had been well honed, and now they had to be perfect. I was always very careful when I left my flat, and I always made sure I was not being followed when I returned. I sent out a hundred copies of my CV to a variety of companies and settled back to wait for interviews to come through. My leaving package from the Ministry of Defence included a cheque for £5,000, although I had previously had to pay them £200 to buy myself out of the army when I asked for my discharge. Like a lot of things when it came to the army, it just didn't make sense. I hired a car from a local dealer who had been a friend of one of my former colleagues, and I also secured my old fishing rights at a country estate owned by a friend. Things were looking good. I had a few quid, a car, and I could fish. I maintained a low profile around town and took care to avoid certain estates and roads namely those that I knew were home to terrorists and other personalities. 
the IRA would have been only too pleased to know what I did about covert operations in their area. I had decided to have an evening fishing the river Brook at Five Mile Town and had returned to a stretch that I had fished on a number of occasions. I had caught quite a few brown trout in the area before, usually around a pound or so in weight, but they were always good sport and great to eat. This particular evening I was not catching anything, it was getting dark, and so I decided to have one or two more casts and then head home. I spotted the telltale circles of water that indicated a fish rising, and my fly dropped right in the center of the ripples. Bang! I was into what I assumed was a reasonable fish, and played it for about fifteen minutes, before easing my landing net into the water and drawing the fish in. It looked like a very impressive catch. I used my portable scales to weigh it, and was amazed to see that it was just over seven and a half pounds, the biggest I had ever caught. It was a gleaming wild brown with red spots down its sides the size of my thumbnails. I decided to return it into the river. I had held it by its tail and let it just scurry from the bank, and as I was about to climb up the river bank and head to my car, I slipped and went head first straight into the river. I leapt out quicker than I had gone in, but was soaked through to the skin, totally drenched. It is still the biggest wild brown trout I have ever caught. I had been a Freemason for a number of years, and attended lodge meetings in Enniskillen and the surrounding areas on quite a few occasions. One of the members of the lodge was a special branch inspector. He was aware that I was leaving the force research unit, and at dinner, after a Masonic meeting, he asked if I would consider joining the RUC. I would have to go through the normal routine and basic training at their headquarters at Knock, Belfast, but as soon as I passed out, he would request that I go straight into his unit. I jokingly asked if I could have that proposal in writing. He laughed and said that I should just trust him. Special Branch had been a constant thorn in my side for the past few years in my previous work, but the offer was quite interesting. I wondered if it was a ploy to get at my informants at the FRU. Special Branch were well capable of doing stuff like that, but I didn't dismiss the idea out of hand. I was invited to the wedding of a cousin in Brixham, Devon, and decided to make a long weekend of it. I flew from Belfast to Birmingham and hired a car. On the Saturday morning, I took a stroll down to the harbour and, to my surprise, spotted the statue of William III, also known as the Prince of Orange, who landed there on the 5th of November, 1688. He was to have a massive effect on the island of Ireland when he led the Protestant army to defeat James II at the infamous Battle of the Boyne on the 1st of July, 1690, a date that is still celebrated by Protestants and still causes trouble in Northern Ireland over 300 years later in the form of the Loyalist marching season. The marches provide major flashpoints for both the Protestant and the Catholic communities, and have ended up with riots taking place in larger cities like Belfast and Londonderry. I was sitting on the harbour wall, smoking a cigarette and drinking a cup of coffee, when I spotted a newspaper stand. A front page showed images of three people I knew, and the headline made my guts wrench. A Chinook helicopter had been flying the top brass of Northern Ireland's military intelligence, special branch, and the security services to Scotland when it crashed, killing all 29 people on board, four crew and the passengers. I had been aware of this regular Junta meeting, as it was nicknamed, which took place outside the province every month. The photograph showed Major George Williams and Captain Roy Pugh, my operations officer and intelligence officer at the FRU. I had played rugby with Roy Pugh and knew him really well. He had been a good man. The image was released by headquarters, taken at an FRU function. I was in the main photograph that it came from. 
I bought a copy of the paper and headed back to my hotel room. My partner took one look at me and asked if I'd seen a ghost. I was drained of colour. I read the coverage of the June 1994 crash in full and was even more shocked to realise the dead included that special branch officer who had approached me about joining his unit. I got through the weekend as best I could and flew back to Northern Ireland to continue my search for work. Chapter 2 I had no replies from my 100 letters and CV applications for months. At last, a single envelope arrived. Finally, a response. But I was swiftly disappointed. A Bristol company called International Security Services, ISS, thanked me for my details and asked if they could keep my details on their database, promising to be in touch if anything suitable was to arise. It seemed that all the work I had put into applications had been for nothing. I decided to spend the evening fishing, threw my fly rod and waders onto the back seat of the car, and headed out to the River Brook at Colebrook, a lovely estate near Five Mile Town. I had once lived there and knew it was a relatively safe place. There were army and police patrols around, and lots of members of the Ulster Defence Regiment and the RUC lived in the area. En route, I spotted a face from my past parked up in a car. This man had been a potential target for recruitment, and I had worked on him relentlessly. Intrigue got the better of my common sense, and I doubled back to park where I could observe what he was up to. About ten minutes passed before two men drove into the car park, one getting out of their vehicle to join the first man. I knew the two blokes to be special branch officers. They were obviously up to their usual tricks and were sneaking my old target away from the FRU detachment. Bastards! I thought about calling my old firm, but, sighing and with a slight laugh at myself, I chose not to. I was not working for them any more. It was none of my business now. I continued to the river and, more satisfyingly, returned home with two rather nice-sized wild brown trout for supper. The bloke in the car was later tried and found guilty of involvement in the infamous Omer bombing of 1998, but would be released on appeal. The Gardai, the Irish police in the Republic, were found guilty of forging notes on the case, and he was acquitted. The police ombudsman would investigate the role of special branch during this period and find them sadly lacking in picking up prior warnings of this attack. I had a good friend who was caught up in the bombing itself. He owned a clothes shop in the high street and was standing outside it, unaware he was next to the car containing the explosives when the bomb was detonated. My friend was blown through his own shop front window and hit a clothes rack. His eardrums were damaged and he was profoundly deaf for months afterwards, but he was relatively unscathed. The owner of a neighbouring shop he had been chatting with was blown into a wall and died instantly. ISS got back in touch to discuss freelance work. I jumped at the chance and flew from Aldergrove Airport on the outskirts of Belfast to Birmingham and then went by train to Bristol. I arrived the night before. My funds were starting to run low, but I did not want to be late for this interview which I felt could just be the opening I was looking for. It was also the only opening that had been offered. I arrived smartly dressed and introduced myself to the receptionist. She looked at me blankly and told me that Mr. Robson, the managing director, was away for the rest of the week. She said there had obviously been a misunderstanding or mix-up on the dates. I had to hide my fury. I'd used up one of my precious return tickets and had put a strain on my bank account to chase a red herring. I began the long journey home with the receptionist having promised me faithfully that she would get the MD to contact me immediately on his return. I rang him myself the following week 
as I was convinced I would never hear from them. He was extremely apologetic and told me that they had a firm job offer and that I could start immediately. I was suspicious to be made an offer without an interview, but needed the work. I had no choice but to take the chance. I didn't even know what the job involved or even how much I would get. It was all a bit crazy. I booked into a bit of a dodgy bed and breakfast in the notorious St. Paul's district of Bristol. I knew the area reasonably well, as I had carried out some joint training undercover exercises with Special Branch there when I was at 14 Int, an Army Covert Surveillance Unit. It was one of the toughest areas to work, and provided excellent training, as there was a lot of drug-related crime, and many of the people on the streets were all very surveillance-aware. On my first day, I met two ex-Avon and Somerset police officers. They had started the company, and chatted about my background and situation. I was to work undercover in a retail outlet in Bristol City Centre, detecting shoplifters and thieves. They also provided uniformed security. It all seemed fine. The wages weren't great, but at least I was going to be doing something. I headed off to introduce myself to the manager and the uniformed security guard, Brian, before wandering around the shop, using the CCTV and learning about the main shoplifters. To my surprise, there were a lot of them. Gangs of teenage girls would send two or three of their members in to harass and threaten the staff on the till to provide cover for others who would help themselves. They were quite open. They let the staff know they were going to steal stock and warned that if they were stopped, they would see them outside when the shop closed. It was effectively intimidating, but I had very little opportunity to do anything about it. Towards the end of the week, Pat Robson turned up to say the retail company, one of the biggest in the UK, could not even afford to employ a store detective and my duties would be covered by the store manager. I was out of a job almost as soon as I got it, pretty much broke and had nowhere to live. Robson told me that some uniformed staff, including Brian, lived communally in a large, empty building near Temple Meads railway station. He was sure that I could move in there until another job arose. I picked up my belongings, and Brian took me on a stroll down through the city and over the river to Temple Meads to my new home. There would be no rent to pay here, mind you. There was no hot running water or front door key. I was to learn the art of squatting, a situation in which I could never have previously seen myself. Brian eased the heavy wooden door of the imposing Victorian building open a few inches, inserting his hand through a gap to push away a plank of wood that held the door shut. I followed him up a flight of large open stairs covered in worn carpet, and Brian pointed to a door, indicating my room. The room stank of damp, had a threadbare carpet, no curtains, and dodgy floorboards that felt sponge-like and soggy underfoot. I had the feeling I would end up in the room below if I didn't tread carefully. This was about as bad as it could get. But I wasn't the only one in this position. Brian said that most of the people in the squat were ex-forces. He had been in the Royal Navy for nine years and had been living here for over a year. Brian advised that most of the guys took their valuables to the left luggage or lost property offices at the station where the woman in charge, herself ex-forces, looked after them for free. There was a sports centre on Temple Way where one of the staff was ex-army physical training corps and allowed us to use the showers. It was good to see that the strong bonds in the forces and veteran community still existed. This was one small silver lining in an otherwise very gloomy outlook. The next few weeks were spent wandering the streets of Bristol. I was amazed at the amount of cash that had been abandoned, both coins and notes, lying in gutters, especially outside pubs and nightclubs. 
checking cash point machines on my travels, I was surprised at the number of times I came across ten and twenty pound notes ignored in the dispenser. This was just about enough, allowing me to see my way through the day with a bag of chips each evening, rolling my own cigarettes instead of buying them in packets. Eventually, the two blokes who ran the company visited the squat. They offered me undercover work in a warehouse, infiltrating the workforce to report on the theft of cigarettes and alcohol. This was what was termed shrinkage in the industry, and most firms allowed for a certain amount. This warehouse was suffering a small epidemic, and they needed to know who the culprits were. I attended a staged interview for a job as a regular warehouse operative. The managing director and the security manager for the group were the only people who were aware of my true role. As far as anyone else was concerned, I had answered an advertisement in the job centre. From my own knowledge of this type of work, I thought that I would be paid the salary for doing the actual work and a sizable consultancy fee for my covert assignment. As it was, they were offering only a hundred pounds a week over the regular pay, but I knew it was that or back to looking around the ground for small change. Robson assured me this was a new contract, and they would get more if it went well, and yet I had my reservations about him. To me, he seemed like a typical ex-copper. I was introduced to the shop floor manager, the stock controller, a few of the warehouse pickers, and the forklift crew on my first day. They all seemed okay. I got stuck in and...